In 2003, little-known jiu-jitsu brown belt shocked the world by submitting four-time world champion Hoyler Gracie. With his defeat over a member of BJJ's legendary family, Eddie Bravo launched himself into mainstream notoriety. Soon after, Bravo would develop an innovative no-gi style of the art entitled 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu. More widely known as the Rubber Guard, Bravo's system would stir controversy in the MMA community as many considered it an insult to the traditional Brazilian art. I don't know what your take is on this if you even have one. Uh, Eddie Bravo is al always a controversial topic in the jiu-jitsu world because a lot of people say that he's, he's claiming things that have been around forever for his own. Like what do you, and he kind of follows the spirit of gi is not important. He, he says that no gi is more important for MMA especially and he has of course his system, the twister and 10th planet. Mm -hmm. um, Jiu-Jitsu, do, do you have any opinion on this? I mean, is, is that something that bothers you? or? Uh, I, I think uh, he's a great market marketing person, you know. Mm -hmm. He's very good in doing marketing. He's very good in create names and, you know, in claim things. But uh, on the bottom of my heart, I don't think he's inventing nothing. It's all stuff of being, like Twister is for, is, is for wrestling movement. That's mm -hmm. 100 years ago. People doing that, yeah. Hober Band Guard. He, he come with good names, you know, yeah. like funny stuff. Come with the Twister, the so crackhead control, I credit to him for that. that. Stuff, yeah. Hober Band Guard, you know, he has the, his tenth, tenth Planet gym and yeah, he's got twenty nine schools. Twenty nine schools of how many world champions? None, I don't think. I have no idea. No. What are your thoughts on Eddie Bravo? Johnny Bravo. <laughs> The, the <laughs> cartoon guy? Eddie. Watch that. <laughs> Eddie Bravo. Oh, Eddie. Oh, the rubber man. Oh, okay, okay, all right. Man, because the other guy, the other time the guy asked me about what I do, I like, what I like in the cheeseburgers. <laughs> I remember uh, that uh, one student of mine one time brought me a book of him and said, hey, this guy, you know, has this new approach and everything. He has some cool stuff, you know, like with the high guard and Nino. Nino Chamber used to do. He has some good variations. He put in a good system on that. You know, but it's it's kind of funny because here I think there's like a kind of like an internet cult about him. You know, they call him the, the, the master and he created his own style and everything. You know, in Brazil, people don't even know too much about him or anything. But here in America, he's kind of famous, you know. Not kind of, he's famous, you know. He's famous. He has this style, this, this things. And I took a look at his book. He had some good stuff in, in the book, you know, some good techniques and everything. But he has this, this 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 thing. I think that's why he's famous because he's very polemic. He talks a lot of, uh, of, of of things that I completely disagree, you know, about some stuff. Like what? Like you know, like about this uh, marijuana cult. Or I mean, I, I mean, you can do whatever you want to do, you know, uh, when when you are alone with your buddies, you know. I'm I'm not a saint. I'm not saying that you know I'm a monk or anything, but. Uh, you know, put on a book, something like that. It's, I think it's kind of, I got a little pissed off in a way that uh, this is a public, he's a guy that people listen, and he's taking money out of my pocket, you know. Um, Eddie, if you buy my DVD, I will let you rename my moves. Uh, I think most of you know I have a campaign with Caio Terra, Felipe Costa, uh, about steroids. I'm completely opposed to that. And uh, recently, uh, some people were talking about uh, use marijuana and practicing jiu-jitsu. I just want to make this very clear. Eddie Bravo is an idiot. What was it like growing up in the Gracie household? Well, um, it's the beautiful thing, you know, because it's not a pressure, you know. We just, they throw us in the match, and, uh, and that's how we learn, you know, it's having a good time, fun, you know, it's no pressure at all, you know. My father always support, the family's always support, you know, we play with the brothers and, and cousins, you know, and that's, that's the best, it's an amazing experience, you know. If you can have a chance to compete one time in life, I recommend, because it's completely different than everything. Actually, to grow up in the family I grow up, we always compete each other in the nice way, you know. We have a lot of brothers, a lot of cousins home all the time, and that's the 
beautiful in the art, you know. My father always create, you know, like a challenge inside the house and make us train and make us motivated. No matter what, he always there to support us. And that's the, the best part, you know. The time you got the family close to you and help you, no matter what happened, nothing better than that, you know. I think I do my part in, in a sport competition. Uh, I can say I'm on the most compete, you know, because I do because I like. You know, I have the design. I love to be there inside the four lines. It make me feel comfortable, make me feel excited. At the end of the day, who win? That's the one that people recognize, you know. It doesn't matter if I win by advantage or for a point or for a finish. In 10 years, the people know who this guy or these guys win 1996 because they know he win. They don't remember the second place. What do you remember about your early fighting days? It seems that there's always a, a story behind each match, you know, about how nervous I was, or what I was thinking, and, and how I only knew a couple moves, and, and how I tried to just, you know, all the little mental games I was playing with myself uh, during those early matches, trying to figure myself out, uh, trying to figure out how to win, trying to figure out how to take my performance in the gym or at the academy and bring it out to the tournament circuit. I was having a lot of trouble. And um, that's basically what, um, you know, my jiu-jitsu is all about, is just <laughs> trial and error and just trying to figure everything out, you know. It's, at first it was, it was a mental thing, but, um, you know, once I conquered that, then I could really, you know, focus on the, the physical, you know, as long as you have the mental game taken care of. And that took years. For me, my whole life was all about music. I was, you know, I moved to Hollywood and, and when I was 21 to pursue my rock star dreams. I've been producing music since I was 10, and it was time to make the big move to Hollywood, and I didn't want to be a fat rock star. So I started, I joined a gym, started lifting weights. I didn't like that, that lasted a day. I got into karate. I was always a big Bruce Lee fan. And, but I could never afford martial arts, so I, you know, I was making a little bit of money. I joined a karate class, got into karate, saw the first UFC, saw what Hoist did. Actually, I saw UFC 2 first. Was blown away, because I wrestled a couple years in high school, and I thought, wow, that's a lot like wrestling. So I, meet, I just fell in love with jiu-jitsu, quit karate, and um, just got obsessed. That was my hobby that I got obsessed. The, the original goal was always you know, to make some waves in the music business. I got pretty good at jiu-jitsu. I thought there might be a chance, you know, I was like a purple belt and I thought there might be a chance that I could do MMA if I was forced to. Purple I did, belt under who? Jean-Jacques Machado? Under Jean-Jacques Machado, yes. I thought I was DJing at the time just until the, the music broke. But I knew that the DJing job wasn't secure, I could lose that job at any time, so I thought if I lost my DJ job, I might do some MMA because I don't want to go back into regular life, waking up at 5.30 in the morning, swinging hammers or roofing or whatever. So I thought, man, my backup plan is going to be MMA. I didn't want to do MMA, but if it, be, if it was between going back to construction or doing you know, uh, some hard labor, my body's not made for hard labor, I would, I would rather do hard labor and work out in MMA. We didn't have any no-gi classes, so I started playing a no-gi game with the gi. I'd have the gi on, but I was already working on my underhooks, my overhooks, and head control. Just in case I did MMA, I wanted to start getting used to, you know, because I would be so far behind on wrestling and, and striking, I would have to focus all my time on that. I didn't want to have to revamp my jiu-jitsu, so I was trying, I was always on this quest to make my jiu-jitsu as MMA ready as possible, just in case I had to do MMA. And, you know, I ultimately quit my DJ job to write for The Man Show, but The Man Show job was not going the way I thought it was going. The show was terrible. It looked like it was gonna get canceled. I'm like, whoa, I was just DJing. I just quit this DJ job that I had for 10 years to work for this 
a TV show that's going to get canceled, I might go, I might have to start fighting MMA. And I really considered it, you know, out of like last resort. As I was training for Abu Dhabi, I won the North American Championships. I, I qualified to do Ab the Abu Dhabi um, submission, the no gi. Uh, uh, championship, which is a which is a no gi jiu jitsu tournament, the biggest one, the most prestigious one. It's the biggest grappling tournament, period. Abu Dhabi Combat Club, right? Yes. I was just so happy that I won a free trip to Brazil. I never really thought I was I was I never thought I was gonna hang with the, the legends. And Hoyler was in my division, and he won every year that he was in, like the, the previous three years. No one ever scored a point on him. I was worried. I didn't. I really didn't have any expectations of doing anything. I was just happy that I got a free trip to Brazil. I never really considered myself like a real athlete. I'm slow, I'm not explosive, I'm not strong. You know, I haven't ran in 10 years and I don't, I don't do any cardio or anything like that. I'm not like this workhorse at all. I was just doing jiu-jitsu for the fun of it. And I was training no gi style with the gi. So when I got to Abu Dhabi, I went against Gustavo Dantas, who was a black belt. I was a brown belt still. And I'm like, here, I'm with all these black belt legends. So I went against my first guy and I, I tapped him out. I got him in a rear naked choke. That gave me a lot of confidence. I'm like, wow, I, 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 can, I can mix it up with these guys. So my next match was Hoyla Gracie. And um, I mean, I, I lucked out and got him in a triangle. And that changed everything. I got my ass kicked in the very next fight by Leo Vieira. He beat me like 30 to nothing or something like that. There was a little bit of talk here recently about possibly you and uh, Hoyler honing it back up, trying to have a rematch. That famous match back at Abu Dhabi, maybe having a, a resurgence there. He's here tonight. I saw him with Damian Maya. I saw him with Damian Maya. Um, whatever came of that, is, is there ever a possibility we might see uh, Hoyler Eddie Bravo part two? Well, it was on. It was on like Donkey Kong. He agreed to it. I agreed to it. That This is what I wanted forever, for years. He agreed to it, did interviews. He did interviews for Tatama Magazine, for Gracie Magazine, talked a lot of shit, and it was on like Donkey Kong. And then all of a sudden, he decided to ask for $50,000 more. Like, he's, he needs $50,000 more, and anybody that's ever done Abu Dhabi, and he's done Abu Dhabi four times, you don't ask for more money, there's no contracts. The Sheik just throws down money like you're a supermodel, he don't give, no one ever asks for money when you go down to Abu Dhabi. You accept it, you bow down, and you compete. No one, there's no contracts, there's no negotiations. Hoyler knows that. For some reason, who knows what the reason is, he accepted, he talked a lot of shit, oh, he's gonna train hard and lightning's not gonna strike twice and all that shit, and then he asked for $50,000 more, and then, of course, the Sheik was offended, and he, uh, he didn't even entertain that offer because nobody has ever negotiated with the Sheik. And that was his way of backing out. So uh, Hoyler backed out. I was down, but unfortunately he wasn't. I just wanted to ask you real quick. This is, a, you know, could be a touchy subject, but of course, uh, the fight with Eddie Bravo back at Abu Dhabi. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of Brazilians, uh, my instructor uh, uh, Seneca included, took it very, very personally. A lot of things that Eddie Bravo said following that fight. Uh, of course, you dominated the grappling scene for so long, uh, and uh, y you know, he, a lot of people felt that you know it was a, a slip up, uh, and you were caught in the triangle choke. Uh, there was talks about a possible rematch uh, of that grappling uh, of that grappling expo. Uh, is that a possibility? Are, are you still looking to possibly come you know, out of retirement and compete again at, at some point? And if so, would you be interested in facing off against uh, Eddie Bravo? I'm not looking for no to be faced with nobody, you know, but uh, yeah, if someone knock at my door, I'm ready. You know, I'm training every day. That's what I do for my whole, my, my whole life. 
you know. But uh, make sure he come with someone real. Don't be with fake stuff, you know. Say, hey, let's go fight. Yeah, I love to see you fight. Well, I love too, but, uh, you know, let's talk. My people don't think it was a fluke. I don't think it was a fluke. We're gonna find out. I think people wanna see it because they wanna find out if, if I got lucky the first time. If I beat him again, ooh. I think the people like to see the fight because they not believe what happened before. And that's a good point. He got lucky. And uh, I'm here again to prove, you know, it's gonna be completely different. No one can really say anything. That's why I wanted it so much. Everybody thought I was lucky. Everyone was, ah, nine out of 10 times, Hoyler would win. I think the people like to see how I can finish him, you know, and that's the they expect. I don't think so. Every time I'm step in the mat, in any match, I think I'm about to win. It doesn't matter who you put in front of me. He can get me, I can get him. What's gonna happen? I'm gonna win the fight. <laughs> Metamorphs three. Oof. No, man, I think it, it was really crucial for me to be able to be in the middle of this, I feel like, you know, and I've been talking to Hoyler for some time, and, you know, like, of course, he's my uncle, and but at the same time, you know, we, we were really business about it, and we approached it in a professional way, and he wants to make the match happen. It had to be the right conditions. We did everything we could to make those conditions, you know, exact and, and to everything that he wanted, and for me, I'm just 100% real with him all the way, and you know we just want to make it happen. It's really simple. You can't predict fights. You know that. It, I, I know the only thing I can control is my training, and how I approach the fight and my strategy. I'm gonna come at him hard, and you know he's a legend. For me to think, for me to sit here and say, oh, I'm gonna beat him again, that would be stupid. He can catch me. You know, most people think that I got lucky and that he would win nine out of ten times, and. I think, I think that's wrong. I think he'll win six out of 10 times, not nine. And which one will this be? We'll see. Fight is a fight, like everybody knows. You know, you make a little mistake, it's done, and you know, your opponent is gonna take advantage no matter what. Sometimes you don't need to make a mistake and he just catch you anyways. Um, I try to do my best for the next one, and uh, I don't like to make some what happened is gonna be, but uh, for sure I'm gonna give him 100%. No one had to convince me to do this at all. I've been, I've been wanting the rematch for the last 10 years. I thought it would be great. I mean, I got lucky that I got to go against a legend once and I wanted to, I had a reason to go at it twice. Most people, the lightweights, everybody's dream was to go against Hoyler back in 1998, 97, and I got lucky enough to get pitted up against him. And I got lucky enough to win. And to have that happen again, that's an amazing. Now we're having a rematch. And I always thought, in my eyes, the rematch would be something that the jiu-jitsu fans would want to see. You know, if Buster Douglas got a rematch with Mike Tyson, I'd want to see it. <laughs> no, actually, I'd just like to say thank you very much for the metamors to put all, everything together, you know. Um, and. I'd just like to say thank you to Eddie, you know, it's kind of, 
for a long time we're looking for this, you know, and then sometimes we don't have time, we just mess each other back and forth, you know, we got own work, everybody working something, and now finally we're back in the same match. <laughs> Let's see what's gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I want to thank, I, and I just want to make this clear, there's a, a large percentage of the Brazilian jiu-jitsu community that is a lot of smart people in it, they just don't know exactly where I'm coming from. There's a, an image of mine that's it's a false image that I opened up my school uh, without the gi because uh, I didn't like jujitsu and I was trying to separate myself from Brazilian jujitsu and that has that could be nothing that could be nothing further from the truth. Just every chance I get to uh, to talk about this and I really don't don't get a lot of press in Brazil. I don't know why, but anytime I do, the small press, I want everyone to know in the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu community that I dropped the gi, I didn't drop it for wrestling or for sambo or for striking or anything like that. To me, the UFC got me into Jiu-Jitsu. Jiu-Jitsu didn't get me into the UFC. I was a UFC fan first, so that was first and foremost, I was a UFC fanatic. And to see the level of Jiu-Jitsu go down in the UFC and to see the wrestlers come in and and just stuff the jiu-jitsu guys, and for a while there, the jiu-jitsu looked really bad. And for me, it, it hurt me. So I thought my hypothesis, my theory, is that the gi was the problem. That every, every second you spend training yanking on the collar and the sleeve, you're not training MMA jiu-jitsu. You're not training jiu-jitsu for the UFC. And then you add punches and elbows. So to me, I just want to make it clear, I am not anti-jiu-jitsu. I'm a jiu-jitsu fanatic, I'm a jiu-jitsu freak. This is the man that's responsible for everything. Just want everyone to know that, that there's a lot of uh, uh, miscommunication and misunderstanding out there. I've been painted out as a, as a bad guy of jiu-jitsu and nothing could be further from the truth. Hey, I'm all hey, about jiu-jitsu. I'm sorry, but today you're a bad guy, I'm a good guy. <laughs> okay guys, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>